secret place, a quiet place to be alone with the Lord. If Jesus needed to choose a place, you need to you choose a place. Mark chapter 1 and verse 35. Give me Mark chapter 1 and verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to where? A solitary place. And there he did what? He prayed. And there he prayed. You know what Jesus is doing here? He's trying to create a favorable environment so that he can find the secret place where God becomes vulnerable with man. You don't know people who have shut the door and spent eight, eight weeks in prayer. They came out with demonic spirits. It's not the room that it is a matter. It's where you get to when you have shut the door. That's the secret place. Your father is in the secret. You see, as I'm saying it now, some people are saying, all these people, listen. Do you know that God is omnipresent? Are you with me? Bro, God is omnipresent. The way he is on the street is the way he is when you close the door. Doors cannot keep God out. Are you here? Have you, have you heard of this thing before that a brother wanted to fornicate with a sister? Real life story or joke, whichever one. The most important thing is get the message. A brother wanted to fornicate with a sister. And then when they entered, the brother locked the doors, closed all the windows, two of them are Christians. And then everything. And then he was about to take off his trouser. And the sister said, they see somebody that can see also. She said, ah, but I've locked the door. She said, you have to lock the heavens. Say said, because God is yours. So whether you are outside, on the road, eh, God is present. In a mox, God is present. It's just that he's not manifest. But God is omnipresent. You can't shut God out because you close the door. So that you close the door does not mean that the, the room now becomes more private or more secret than the road. Is that when you shut the door, it gives you a consciousness of a loneliness and grants you the privilege to be able to ascend to find God where He is. And where God is, the Bible calls it what? The secret place. Are you with me? This is why people go to mountains to pray. They are trying to shut off that distractions. Anything that can draw them to the natural realm. They go to the mountain. So in that, in the quietness of that place, it becomes easier to access the secret place. When you choose a consistent place and you are consistently going there to meet with God, very soon it will become very easy to, for you to access where God is hiding. It's not as if um, all of a sudden you become a master at it. No. What will happen is, because you have become a frequent caller, because you have begun to prioritize abiding, when you come, God will be willing to expose himself to you. That's how you grow in prayer. God can now trust you with dimensions of his presence. That even before you arrive, God is waiting. Some of you have experienced it. There are seasons in your life where you just enter your secret place before you say, Kaaba presence you are broken into God's bedchamber just now and some days you have to do that thing for three hours go 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 any bed that flies will distract you they open one door in the house you hear it you have to do that thing for three you know why you are behind the door but you have not accessed the secret so Jesus needed to go to a solution. Do you think that if Jesus wanted to sit in the middle of his disciples and say, Father, you think God won't come? Are you with me? But Jesus himself will step out. Look at Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, give me verse 16. Luke chapter 5 and verse 16. So he himself often withdrew where? Into the wilderness. And did what? Prayed.
if it is your bed a corner of your bed make it such a place that you can lie down there and shut the door the most important thing is create that sense of aloneness with the Lord you want to be a good place for prayer is a place where there are minimal distractions it's a good place for prayer minimal distractions that you can get lost in God and not be drawn back to this realm you do your best that you can shut, shut down Billy Akoni in one of his books he was talking about his wife I read that book 2005 the title of the book is No More Two it's a book on marriage I think I used to have a copy it should still be in my library and he was speaking about his wife that when his wife wants to pray that he didn't understand it at first that she would take a shawl and put it on her head has anybody read that book? Eh? you remember that? do you remember him saying that? you don't remember she would take a shawl and put it on top of her head to her that's how she shuts the door are you with me? she would just wear the shawl on her head she's trying to find a private place so that it is easy to find where God is, is, is dwelling. That place where God is, the Bible calls it a secret place. If you don't have a prayer altar where all the infrastructure of priesthood is properly aligned, you will not find a secret place. And if you were here on the first day, I told you about the infrastructure of priesthood. There is the priest, there is the altar, and then there is the sacrifice. It must be aligned. The one, First Peter chapter 2 verse 5, it says that we all are being built up as a spiritual house to offer what? Spiritual sacrifices. The believer is a priest. So you must approach prayer with the understanding that what you are doing is priesthood. So he that comes, I told you, I spoke about the priest extensively on the first day. Your heart, which is the altar, must be properly aligned. They cannot be flowing issues that are of carnality and lust and then you are attempting to do priesthood before the Lord. The infrastructure will be damaged. In that sense, the first thing you need to do is deal with the matter of the priest. In some cases, the altar is broken down. Stones are gone. No wood anymore. There's nothing to put a sacrifice on. The altar is destroyed. Either you are inconsistent with time. Either you have not determined that you want to do business with God. Or, you, are, you, you see... There's a sacredness with which you approach prayer. There's a sense of responsibility with which you approach prayer. God can tell when you are just doing it out of, out of carelessness. There's no sacredness. There's no sense of responsibility when you come to prayer. A Christian that is living like that, your altar is broken down. It won't have the capacity to draw anything from the realm of God. And you know, dear brother, altars eh? every Christian spiritual altar is supposed to be a reference for God contact what do I mean by that go and read scriptures anytime they made contact with God what did they do they will build an altar let me see if I can find it Exodus 17 give me verse 14 and 15 Exodus 17 14 and 15 let me see if that's a scripture I can use aha then the Lord said to, said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance, remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. 15. And Moses did what? Built an altar and called his name what? Jehovah Nisi. You will hear the Bible say that Abraham built an altar unto the Lord that appeared to him. So altars were supposed to be, are supposed to be references of the contacts you have made with God. 
So your prayer altar will be as potent as your ability to curate your spiritual encounters. As God encounters you, you turn those encounters into spiritual monuments that you can stand on to be able to engage God. You curate them. That's what Moses did here. He built an altar and he called, he built it unto the one who is called the Lord is my banner. Same thing Jacob did when the Lord appeared unto him. He built an altar and he called the name of the place Bethel, the house of God. There was no building there, but he curated it because it was a reference to a God contact. I made contact with God here. So I have built an altar as a memorial. So every time I come, I am confident that God met me. If he met me before, he can meet me again. Some of us, our altars are broken down. That's why when Elijah wanted to draw a reality from heaven, the first thing he did was to repair the altar. If you made covenants with God and you are not keeping it, you have damaged your altar. You made vows to God, you are not keeping it, you have damaged your altar. Remember, it is the covenant that legalizes the spirit. It's the sacrifice that legitimizes the spirit. That's why the Bible warns us, do not be in a hurry to make an oath. Oh God, 2023, every 3 a.m., I'll be on my knees and pray for four hours. The day you were saying it, God heard and Satan heard. Then God will be coming every 3 a.m. The only problem is that you will never be there. Every time he comes, you're on the bed. Dozing. Every time he shows up like that and he doesn't find you there, you have weakened your altar. You are telling the spirit realm that this altar does not have capacity to host and to legitimize the things that I have in mind. 